You're listening to the Author Stories Podcast. Bringing you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Margaret Wyatt. Terry Brooks. Sheena Kamal. Matthew Quick. J.T. Ellison. Walt D. Williams. Brad Ford. Corey Dr. O. Brandon Sanders. Robin Mom. Ernest Klein. Jim Butcher. Sherwin Harris. Visit HankGarner.com for archives of all the shows. Today's guest is... Well, thanks for joining me again for the Author Stories Podcast, where I bring you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Today, I am super excited to have Katie Crouch on the show with me. She has an amazingly unique book, uh, Embassy Wife is the title of it, and what a wonderful, wonderful read this is. Um, it is ex- it is nothing um, that I expected, and then at the end of it, it was everything that I wanted, um, and uh, I think you, the listening audience, are going to love this book, and it's definitely a must-purchase uh, when you hear this. So go out and grab it. We're going to have links in the show notes of this episode. Welcome to the show, Katie. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to have you. Um, Katie, we begin each show with the same question, and that question is, what is your first memory of wanting to be a writer or storyteller? Uh, that would be fourth grade. <laughs> and um, I had just read um, Nancy Drew's, I think it's The Secret Clock. And it was such a great read and such a great um, mystery that I decided I wanted to tell um, stories like it myself. Um, so, yes, I wanted to be a, a writer since fourth grade. Love that. So, you know, um, since fourth grade, you knew that this was something that you wanted to do. Um, but was this something that you planned to do as you, you know, went through adolescence and then finished high school and then, you know, college or, or whatever your path was from there? Did did you retain that desire or was it like a, a whole lot of us where, um, you know, writing kind of comes back around to us uh, in the midst of, uh, you know, building a life and family and all that stuff? Yeah, I uh <laughs> When I was young, I really thought I would be a writer, um, especially in grade school. I was very much um, the shy girl in class, and um, and I did a lot of writing, you know, on my own. And then um, in high school, I continued, you know, and I still thought, oh yeah, that's what I'm going to do. And but I think it's you, you can be damaged, I think, by a bit too much attention and success very young. As in, I was sort of the the writer girl that got all the awards and so then when I went to college I fell quite quickly into reality (laughs) that maybe (laughs) I wasn't the genius that I thought that I was you know I what um and I might I took my first writer's workshop at Brown University and you know was definitely not the was not great and my my co my um my classmates were telling me so so then I lost confidence and I decided, nope, I'm not going to be a writer. It's too hard. So obviously I didn't have very much grit. Uh, but then um, as life went on um, after college and I started to have all these jobs that I was just ter- terrible at. Like I thought I would be a lawyer. And then I, um, I, I worked at a law firm and I got fired for, um, for losing some like really important papers with people's actually Calvin Klein's social security number. Oh no. Like, oh, no. like in New York, you know, and I was a waitress and I was really bad at that. And I was okay in marketing and advertising because that was storytelling. But really the only thing I've been able to do successfully for a long period of time is, is fiction writing. So um, it turned out it just like was the, it was the only option for me after many, after many tries at other things. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which is, I think is the case for a lot of writers. Cause it's not, you know, it's not an easy job and it's yeah not, yeah and it's not necessarily i mean it is fun if you are someone that loves to sit in a room and make up stories in your head but that's not everybody so it's not no <laughs> so, yeah so it took some it took a little bit of of back and forth thing before i decided to commit to it katie you um you live in vermont now is that right that's right yeah but you were not born and raised in vermont were you no, I was born, um, well, I was raised in Charleston, South Carolina. I was born in New York, 
I love to to look at um, kind of how a sense of place um, tends to seep into uh, the stories we tell, sometimes in in very unique ways and and ways that aren't obvious, um, or um, you know how a sense of place affects the the kind of creative person uh, that you are. Do, do you mm-hmm. notice any ways that that Charleston and and uh, that sort of upbringing um, has seeped into your creative life? Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah. So, um, right. Cause I, I started off that I was born in New York city, but we moved to Charleston, South Carolina when I was one. So I really feel like a Charlestonian, although real Charlestonians would tell you that I'm not a Charlestonian and that a real Charlestonian has been there for three, gen- you know, their, their time was born before them because it's a, it's a place that very much, especially in when I was there as a child, um, valued sort of old school who who was there in social structure and um, in class. And class comes from how long you've been there, um, not just how much money you you have. Sure. So, um, so I have a yeah, I have definitely um, that childhood, and also I moved there um, probably I guess seventy four, which is just maybe five or six years after school segregation. So this is, you know, we're talking about a very specific time in the deep South in Charleston. Yeah. And um, so that, you know, it was a place that was very beautiful. Appearances were really important, but it was not progressive and, um, and very, very segregated. And also, you know, nothing was equal in terms of gender, gender roles either. So, um, and now I grew up, my parents were academic, so we were very much on the outside of this, but at the same time, you know, we lived there. So there was this juxtaposition sure. of having an outsider's view, but also trying to fit in because I was a kid, you know? Um, so I think all of those things kind of bubble up in all of my books. And um, so that sense, so that sensibility definitely um, is in Embassy Wife because the first thing that I noticed when I moved to Namibia, which is um, just north of South Africa, um, was the very similar social structures as in it's a very segregated place because um, apartheid is very much still, I mean, it's over, but it's the shadows are there very, you know, the, you can hear, hear it loud and clear. Um, and it felt very much like Charleston in the eighties to me. Um, not that I was trying to portray that, you know, so didactically in this, I mean, I'm not the kind of writer that's like, let me teach you a lesson. But I think those, <laughs> I have those concerns and, um, and I, and so that those themes are, it's interesting. So I just read my, I just reread my first book for something I had to do, um, which is uncomfortable. I think reading yeah. a novel that you wrote 18 years. I mean, I, I think I, I, uh, I still like it. I mean, but it's interesting that I, I like have exactly, almost exactly the same concerns as I, everything sort of mirrored. Um, and I think it's because of, yeah, I had a very specific, I, I grew up in a very specifically w- unique and somewhat strange place, um, which is Charleston. But Charleston is, and that said, I adore Charleston and I, I very much hope to go back there someday, but it's, it's interesting. It's a, it's a real soup. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> for sure. Yeah. Speaking of going back and, and reading that first novel, um, because in, you know, when I was reading Embassy Wife, which I absolutely adore, like I said earlier, um, and then start looking back over your back catalog at the other novels that you published, Embassy Wife sort of sits um, to the side. Um, it doesn't it's it doesn't fit genre wise um, with your previous work in in a lot of ways, it appears like um, what was. What was what was the first book that you published, and uh, what were kind of the circumstances around the, uh, you know, how that book was born, and and what kind of broke you out as a writer? Mm-hmm. My first book was um, called Girls in Trucks, and it was a novel in stories um, about one young woman. Her name's Sarah Walters, and she's from. You know, my, I mean, I many of my books are, um, you know, shadows of my real life. Right. So, um, so Sarah Walters is a, um, debutante from Charleston from an old family, which is not what I was, but, um, and then she moved to New York and sort of 
um, found the world sort of gray and cold. <laughs> um, so it's um, it's an episodic novel, but it does it does have an arc. And um, you know, I think I don't know what genre that would be. I mean, I think it's literary fiction. That that book um, touched a nerve though, because a lot of people read and bought that book. Um, and so uh, that book took you know it took a long time to write. I think one's first book does take a long time to write. Uh, I revised every single chapter like probably thirty or forty times, which is not something I do now because I have more <laughs> definitely more confidence and um and also just you know I want to do I want to like write more so I'm like I'm not going to rewrite this 20 times because <clears throat> let's get on to the next you know why I'm not as precious about it but right. that said I um you know when I look at those sentences and I'm like wow that's a pretty damn good sentence you know I really yeah. worked that that was there's nothing there's no extra in that book um and uh and so that book was, you know, it would, but I, I found, you know, I was in a, mm, what can I say? I found youth and first love and being a young woman um, difficult. I have definitely um, a history of taking things very seriously, anxiety and depression. And I think that definitely, you know, the black book is dark and my books sure, get sure. lighter as, as my life goes on. It's funny that I have a back. I'm it's a little bit sobering that I'm old enough to have a back catalog, but I um, I do think as my as time goes on that um, that I'm much more interested in in humor now, just because I find I find it's much easier to get through life with a lighter eye on things than just sort of taking everything so seriously. But um, so that, but I wouldn't say. I mean, I guess the genre is different in that that's a you know a very you know it's pretty dark. And but it's uh, about a um, and it's about dark topics, and Embassy Wife also is about dark topics, and it's about you know again that's about I, women and isolation and gender roles, and this also is about women and isolation and gender roles. But I think it's just like the tone is vastly different, like 180, you know, yeah. like, um, and and I think that's sort of where and you know I think people change as they as their art changes as they as they keep working and working. Um, I definitely, my last book called Abroad was also very dark, um, but I think I can tell you that the next book I just finished is another one that's pretty humorous. So I think this is sort of more where I'm going um, after many hours at the notebook. Looking for a tool to help you visualize your story before the drafting begins? Plot Pins is cloud-based and optimized for any device. But there's nothing to download. From the new writer who isn't sure how to tell their story to the veteran who can increase their productivity dramatically, we've had experienced writers lay out a detailed structure for several novels in a series in a matter of a few days. The app takes you through four steps of the process, the concept or logline. Make sure you have a solid concept that you can keep coming back to throughout the process. The outline, 12 beats and three acts, each has a description of what should be happening with examples. The board, 40 cards. We take the 12 beats and add sub-beats to those, breaking it down even further and being very specific about what should go into each. These also have examples and descriptions. Right. We take those 40 cards and turn them into a to-do list. For a 50,000 word book, it's about two cards per chapter roughly. We have a beautiful editor built into the app. You can export your manuscript to a PDF anytime with the click of a button. Let Plot Pins help you visualize your writing project. Use code HANK10 to get 10% off Plot Pins. PlotPins.com. Authors, I have a fantastic new service to tell you about. It's called PubSite. PubSite is a service to help you build your very own website, your home on the web, where you can promote your work and give your fans a place to connect with you. PubSite is a website platform that allows every author, regardless of budget, to have a great looking professional website developed by the book marketing professionals at FSB Associates. PubSite is the new easy to use DIY website builder developed specifically for books and authors. Whether you're an author of one book or 20, or a small publisher, PubSite allows you to build, design, and most importantly, update your website pain-free. No need to be dependent on a designer or webmaster 
to make a small but costly change to your website. Save the money and do it yourself. PubSite is the best platform for authors because it's a book-centric platform. PubSite was built just for authors and small publishers. Every design, feature, and layout is book-centric. They have customized designs for you to use. It's easy to build. No coding or HTML is necessary to create a stunning, professional-looking website with all the features you want. Get a custom domain name, yourname.com. It's simple to update. You can add all of your books, add a blog and a book tour, sell from any retailer, manage your email list and social media, and even do e-commerce. Build your website with a 14-day free trial, then pay just $19.99 per month, which includes hosting, and we offer packages starting at $499 to set up the website for you. Pub-Site.com, the place to help authors find their home on the web. <laughs> right. <laughs> Talking about those those first books and and holding um, your writing as, as very precious. Um, that's something that, that new writers struggle with a lot, I think, is that um, when you're writing that first book and especially when it, it feels like um, that you've you've connected with someone, it's going to be uh, published and um, you know that that first experience of having your work out there, uh, it it kind of feels like this is like everything you write is your magnum opus. This is going to be, it, it needs to hold everything that I believe about everything, and it needs to, you know, I need to address all the things that I've ever wanted to address. And um, and and then as you you know get five or six books out there, um, d- does that feeling um subside? Does it not? Does everything not feel that important? That that everything has to be. Um, everything that you want it to be. Um, th- does that feeling ever subside? It does. I mean, it's a lot like getting just life, right? When when you're young, when one is young, I mean, when I, I'm not going to say, I I, just, I have this habit <laughs> of doing the you and it's like, well, I don't know what you think. So Hank, <laughs> Hank's like, you're not me. When I was young, you know, I, it's, you know, every day seems like, oh, this is so exciting. And, and I, I, you know, this would be the, the last time I'm ever going to have this experience with this person or go to this party or travel to this place. But then, you know, now I'm 47. So now I have like thousands and thousands of days that have gone by. <laughs> right. Sure. So, yeah. um, so I'm like, well, I might actually go to France again because I've been there before. And, you know, I, <laughs> like, I had a great dinner here, <laughs> but, you know, I also had 40 other. So it's it's a little like that. It's like, OK, so. Now there's just more material out there, right? So you have, yes, yes, your first book is really important because it's the first thing people read to, if they yeah. see the first impression they get of you. And, um, but then, you know, your second book, oh, the pressure. The pressure, especially if your first book was done semi well, you know, everyone's just sort of like, oh, is that, that author going to fall on her face? How's that going to go? So I would say the third book is right, is right when you're like, okay, I can actually relax a little now because <laughs> I have more material. So yeah, um, I do think um, as time goes on, and also, it's, you know, now, now it's your job. It's like, okay, I can do this. I know I've done this. I've, and um, my second book was not a novel in stories. It was, it's called Men and Dogs, and it's a, it's a, it's a novel, you know, like, yeah, full on arc novel, but I'd never done that before. So, and I had it all hinged on this big. I always do this to myself as I have this huge question like, someone's missing, or someone has a secret, or someone died, and who killed them? And I never know at the beginning. So, that's very risky, right? Because then what if I never know? And then, this my men and dogs, there was a father that went missing, and the question was, what happened to him? And I realized right about the third, the three fourths mark, which is sort of the novelist's death trap, right? That's and that's right when you, you know, there's so many novels I've read where I'm like, oh, this is where this, this is where this person's having problems. Or when you see a movie that's like three quarters of the way done and things go like haywire, you know that that's a pro, you know, it's a real death trap. So I was, um, and I, I just was like beside myself. I was like, I don't know what I'm doing. I, I'm, I don't know what happened to this father. I'm, I'm just. I really had, it was as close to like just utter despair as I've ever been. Um, but I figured it out, right? So now it's book, what is the six? Because I've done a couple young adult books. 
and I was like, okay, I don't know quite what's going to happen. Oh, no, sorry. This is the one I'm working on now. Like, I don't quite know what's going to happen, but I know I'm going to figure it out because I have, you know, so it's like, it's just, an, uh, yes, as you write more and you mess up more, <laughs> you have more failures, things become, and more successes, things become easier and, and you, you know, just eventually yeah. you learn not to lose sleep over it and p- pace the floor and, you know, have to drink wine in the middle of the night. To- <laughs> <laughs> which is <laughs> better than having... Demons. <laughs> which is which is better than having to drink wine in the middle of the day, I guess. To, yeah, to get I mean, through. neither yeah. is terrific. Neither is terrific, <laughs> but um, unless you're at dinner, Graham. Right. <laughs> you get you get fewer stairs. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Did you say earlier, Katie, that you lived in Namib- Namibia? Namibia? Excuse me, I couldn't. couldn't That's a hard word that. to say. Yeah. Namibia. Did, Namibia. Namibia. No. Yeah. yeah. Um. I yes, my family and I lived in Namibia. We um. And to be just to, you know, I don't want anyone to have any, um, any, any sort of concept that I'm an expert in Namibia. I did not know where it was on the map before I moved there. I was, I moved there because my husband had a job. Um, he were both writers and he won a Fulbright to teach. We both teach. Um, and so, uh, we all, I picked up, I quit my, my own job. Um, and we left and we moved there for two years and we had, I had a six week old baby and a seven year old daughter. Wow. And, um, and yeah, it was, I, I really thought that I was like, um, super adventure, you know, just like tough. Like I was like, I can do this. This is no, whatever, of course. And I'll, you know, my, fr- and my, you know, my mom friends, my, cause I, I was already a mom. We're like, you're insane. Like, that's crazy. I was like, no, it's not. You're just being boring. <laughs> Moving to Namibia is totally the everyone should do it. And I got there and I'm like, all right, this is actually super hard. Like there are snakes and uh, my daughter is not vaccinated for all these things and she, she takes malaria pills. She has like goes, you know, sleepwalks around the house and has night terrors. You know, it's all it's not just you. You know, I, I remember traveling right. in Africa and Asia and all over m- myself with a backpack. But when you have other little people that need looking after it's it's a whole different ball game so um so yeah that's i can the imagine i i had never heard of namibia um except for um i i remember angelina jolie i believe it was decided to have her uh her baby uh in namibia and i remember that being a news story I, I don't know, uh, 15 years ago or, or so. And and before that, never heard of Namibia and never heard of it since that I know of until Embassy Wife came along. And I, I thought it was a such a fascinating setting. But, you know, in the back of my mind, uh, I was wondering, you know, like w- what would what would drive Katie to set a novel here? Why why pick this place? And now hearing that you have a personal connection there, of course, it makes sense. Yeah. No, I wouldn't. Yes. And we have. Yes. We, my family adores Namibia and we, but yeah, it's a very out of, it's like, I think it's like the second least populated country in the world. It's it's a very strange country. It's, um, sorry, Namibians. (laughs) 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 Uh, It's parked on the Western side of Africa, right above um, South Africa. And it used to be a German colony. And then it was a South African sort of outpost. And then it began. It gained independence. So it's it's a very young country. It was gained independence in, I believe, 1991. And yeah, I mean, Angelina Jolie is like the one famous person that's ever been there. I think Prince Harry went there once on a safari, but like, um, and uh, she actually is a big, she's like the celebrity. She goes back sometimes. She owns like a, a cheetah conservancy. Um, and if, and as one does. Yeah, as one does. And, um, and it's funny because the lions and the cheetahs are all named like Brad, <laughs> even though they broke up. Um, and also there's like, there's a lot of like, you know, the locals tell like, you know, I, I think, I think that she has a um, a lot of good intentions, but um, the what is done behind closed, but when she's gone at those, these places is perhaps not what she would be thrilled to know about um, from the, what I hear from the locals. Um, yeah, and I'm sure that's uh, <laughs> worldwide with a, a lot of cases that yeah. the, the public facing um, story is much different than the real story. Yeah, completely. Um, so, but yeah, and it's um, it's mostly desert and uh, it has these amazing. San- I mean, if, if one could visit 
I would totally recommend it because it's very safe. It's not every country not in the continent of Africa is safe, right? Just because of basic economic, like economics and politics. Yeah. But Namibia really is. You can rent a truck and get some camping gear and just drive around and see these amazing places and just drive up to a lodge and, um, you know, get out and go into the game drive, see zebras, lions. You don't want to like, if it says don't get out of your car, don't get out of your car because you will be eaten by a lion. I mean, that like happens all the time. <laughs> like, like you wouldn't believe it. It was just, you know, the, I, and some people were, I, um, this woman worked with me to, um, help me with my, my child. Cause I was just <laughs> going that. And she was like, she was, she said, yeah, my, my, my sister was eaten by a lion. You know, it's just like something that happens there. Just like mm, mm. <laughs> by a lion. It's just like, a, that's your reality. So it's, it's very, you know, and, and it's kind of, it's, I loved being there because especially when being out and they call it the Veld, V-E-L-D, which is the bush and nothing around you. All you hear is just like wind coming from a hundred miles away. And, you know, the at night, um, the night creatures are super loud, like super loud. Like, um, and it's just, it's such a lovely feeling to be so close to like nothing, nothing human, you know? Um, it gave me a lot, especially in this time of climate change, it just gave me, I was like, okay, there's room for everyone. We just need to come to Namibia. It's plenty of room here. <laughs> <laughs> there's no water. But, um, you know, so yeah, it was a, it was very life-changing for me uh, living there and and also living in a society where not everyone has everything they want every second of the day, you know? Right, right. Um, so, yeah. So, Katie, from living there and, um, uh, you know, experiencing life in this new place, when did uh, when did the novel start taking shape? Um, because there's one one thing to be, you know, kind of fascinated with a place and, uh, you know, feeling like you're absorbing the culture. And it's another thing for a story to to pop up in your mind, you know, involving, um, you know, this this great the the backdrop of the setting and the unique people that you might experience and you know when when did a plot start taking shape? Mm-hmm. That's a great question because actually uh, when I finished my first draft of the book and I gave it to my editor, she said there's not enough Namibia in here. It was very much a character driven book. Uh, Interesting. So because now I think um, you know I went back and sort of titrated everything I rem- you know loved about, but I. It wasn't my first instinct to write like a travel book, you know, like, yeah, it is, and yeah. it is sort of people say there, you know, what I've read of reactions are, oh, she does such a great job of describing Namibia, like a travel log, um, which is came later because the first thing I was very interested in were, um, you know, female friendships and when what happens when one is isolated and, and away from home um, and also all different kinds of female, you know, how how women you know, and mothers who are from different backgrounds and different places, how we all have, you know, we turn to each other in these times. <laughs> um, so the plot, um, plot started out with, you know, just focusing on these, these three women um, who are very different, right? There's Amanda, who's the protagonist, and she's sort of, I don't want to say she's flat, but she's like kind of the straightforward, pragmatic. She's your Trojan horse, right? She's the one that came, comes to the place. And we see mostly things through her eyes, at least at the beginning. And then there's um, the State Department. And then I found the State Department culture, as you can probably tell um, by reading the book, I find that was fascinating to me. It was like um, how, how, diplomat, how diplomats live abroad and like the social structure of that. And um, <clears throat> so there's another character who is, um, she's the wife of a diplomat, but she very much sees herself as part, as an employee of the State Department in everything she does. Her name is Persephone. And then I, I had a third character. Then I wanted, I was like, okay, I have these two Americans, but what I really want is the clash, the culture clash. So um, I have a third main character. Her name is Mila Shalongo, and she is a government wife, um, Namibian, very wealthy, very elegant, but like completely different backgrounds. And, um, and so I, ha- I was like, okay, how do I have these three um, sort of come together in some sort of mea culpa? And what happened... And, and I was dry, so in the first chapter, I don't think it's not a spoiler to tell you about the first chapter. In the first chapter, um, one of the women brings is is in charge of a banquet. So the the other one brings her an or has an oryx corpse. An oryx is like a a, a Namibian stag, and um, 
and sort of throws the corpse at her feet and says, here, here's your meat, you know? And that um, came because I was driving to school one day and I was behind a Baki, which is a truck. And there was this like two Oryx corpses, <laughs> just like, just like tied to <laughs> the back and like, and like their tongues out and everything, just staring at me, just like, Bleh. and I was like, oh my God, this is so Namibian. Cause like hunting is huge there. And, and that is something you do. You're like, Hey, I'm going to bring you some, you know, we're going to have, it's called a bry. We're going to have a bry. I'm going to bring you a, you know, a warthog. <laughs> <laughs> So, so I was like, okay, that would be, I just pictured the scene of like these, this elegant woman and this other one just throwing this corpse at her feet. And I just, I just sort of loved that. And so, um, that's and people's there, yeah. Disney dreams were, were, were shattered yeah. at that moment. Yeah. No yeah. Bambi here. Or actually Bambi, <laughs> Bambi's mother, right? Bambi's mother. Right. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so that, I wrote that first scene and then, and then I just sort of, I was like, okay, everyone needs a secret. So, um, you know, Amanda's. Husband has a secret he's keeping from her that I can't, you know, that I really, I'm probably not going to tell. And um, Mila, you know, everyone needs a problem, right? It's like, I don't know if you play gin rummy, but yeah. Um, yeah. But like, you know, you lay cards, you lay down cards so that later you can match up the same suit. I mean, that's right. sort of, I'm, I'm not a great gin rummy player, but that's, you know, I do remember that. And I, I find it just like that. I play every character needs some sort of card, some sort, I don't even know why. Like, I'll be like, okay, this person has a cat because that cat's going to come back late. It's like check off in the gun or Mila is right. in a loveless marriage. So how's that going to work out? And Persephone, she suspects that her husband's in the, in the CIA. Well, okay. That gives me, that's great. Is he or not? <laughs> you know, like, just like, so everyone has a, a, some sort of question. And then, so by the end, I, you know, you, uh, author can, if you're being nice to yourself, can sew it up into something. Um, so yeah, that's, it's kind of where it came from. And then I just started writing down all the nuts things I was seeing. I mean, a, a lot of things just were straight up. This is what I was seeing around me. And it was, you know, can't, that's a writer can't ask for more, you know, sort of gold. <laughs> so, yeah. Speaking of, of Chekhov's gun and, you know, the, the adage is, uh, you know, don't put a, a gun on the mantle if you're, if you're not planning to use it, you know, if you, you plant things for the reader knowing that that they're going to pay off later um it, is that kind of your mo to to set up problems for yourself that and then you know in hopes uh that the story will will pay off down the road oh yeah yeah i definitely do that because i'm not an outliner i just I, I i'm not great at that if i i've tried but i get very bored <laughs> with like yeah. oh yeah. this is exactly what's going to happen well why am I doing this? <laughs> you know, I know, like, you... oh, you're going to die tomorrow. What's the point? So I, um, so yeah, I like, I'm like, okay, everyone. Yeah. So I have, yeah, I love the Chekhov's gun thing or whatever it is, but I, and I like to make it sometimes really random, you know, and then, you know, at, at, and these had everything changed. You know, at first I think I had one of the characters dying of some like l terrible disease. And I was like, Wait, this is just, I'm like crying writing this. I don't want to do this. Um, so sometimes, you know, one has to go back and and change whatever that thing was to make it make sense. But I do like to have so because it gives it gives if you're writing a long thing, it gives you something to write towards. Right. Um, right. And I also love another trick. I have a lot of tricks because I have to. Well, tricks um, are good. Tr tricks are so what, good. Whatever, whatever works <laughs> for you. Yeah. Is that and I. um you know, and I think, and I actually looked for this because someone said, told me this was a Hemingway thing, but then I looked and I can't find anywhere where you actually said it, where you end at the, in the middle of a great sentence so yep. that the next day you're in the middle of that sentence and you're like, bum, 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 you know, just keep going. I do that. I, I, that's great. Um, and I think it's Hemingway, but I haven't been able to, because I tried to get it from my, I also teach writing here at Dartmouth College and I tried to, tried to find it to get, to, to read it to them but then I was like I, I failed um but um yeah just all sorts of things to keep to keep me going and then you know if I'm really stuck then I just put it down and I'll read something else that's of a writer that's much better than me and then I'm like okay <laughs> try to do I'm gonna try to do this like what Zadie Smith did let me try that so um so yeah Tricks. So if if you had to um, if you're stuck on an elevator and you needed to pitch Embassy Wife to someone, how would you describe what the story in, in in its essence is about? 
Oh, okay. Well, I would say it's about um, a family that moves to Namibia um, and a woman has followed her husband there for his job unhappily. And then she finds out that he's brought her there for reasons he hasn't told her. He has his secret he's trying to, he's trying to solve from his past. So even though that's very simple and like, I think that it's, there are a million tangents to that in the book, not a million, but 10. Um, I think that's, that's kind of the driving for me. That's the driving force is the, is the husband who has, he has someone that he's trying to find from his path. And, um, and that's, you know, cause that really colors the whole marriage. They are keeping a lot of secrets from each other. And at the end, I think, you know, this, this book is a lot about like how about long there's about how long does marriage you know is is, is this forever <laughs> how, how, I mean you know it's a, it looks at the essence of, it does look at the the essence of a of a long relationship um in, in yeah in three different ways right because there are three different relationships and um I think if I wrote it again I might have not just traditional marriages but um no oh, that's for next time Hank <laughs> So, Katie, what are you working on now? Because if we know anything about the publishing industry, Embassy Wife has probably probably been off your desk for a while now, um, you know, while it goes through the publishing process and revisions and all that. Um, what story has has come knocking on your door? I have just finished another book. Um, that's my it's called. Well, I, don't know, I can tell you the title. Right now, the working title is You're Going to Love It Here. And it's about a family that moves to um, a small town in Vermont. And um, the mother character, who's the main character, her name is Frances. She is drinking wine in her closet um, one afternoon, <laughs> hiding from her family. She hears a, a scream outside. And so she goes out to the barn to investigate the barn, not the bar, Hank, the barn. <laughs> And um, and she finds a skeleton that's dressed up as herself. Um, and there's a and there's a, a note that says um, it says something. It's I can't, it, I think it just changed, but it said no. Right, it used to say know thy priorities, Francis Cross. So it's some sort of it's a it's a humorous novel, but it's also a bit of a you know it's a mystery of who's who's trying to threat. Someone's trying to send her a message, and she doesn't know why. Um, in one week's time. So yeah, it's a, That's amazing. It's a, it's kind of a, a satire and a mystery, all rolled up into one. I just That's finished good. it. That sounds like the perfect combination: satire and mystery. I love it. Can't wait to see where you go with that. Uh, Embassy Wife is available everywhere now. Uh, wherever you purchase books, you can go grab it. We're gonna put links in the show notes where you can grab it in Kindle edition or hardcover or. The audio book uh, is also available. Um, Katie, if people are just discovering you and want to dig into all the great stuff that you do, where can they uh, find you online? I'm most faithful to my Instagram at Katie Crouch Right. Um, and I think that's a good that's a good place to start. Uh, that's where all the good uh, yeah. vibes are on Instagram. Yeah, I like pictures. I don't do yeah. much Twitter because I write all <laughs> already. This is like more writing. But- Twitter has um, a tendency yeah, to kind of be a dumpster Instagram fire right. anyway. Yeah. Great. Really? Uh, yeah. Whew, yeah. We'll put, uh, we'll put links to the Instagram and where they can uh, grab the book in the show notes of this episode. Uh, Embassy Wife, available everywhere now when you're hearing this. Go grab it today. Katie, thank you so much for taking time to come on the show. Thank you, Hank. It's been a lovely show. Thank you. Wargate Books presents Hit and Fade, Forgotten Ruin, Book Two, by Jason Onspach and Nick Cole. Narrated for you by Christopher Ryan Grant. Chapter One, the army of the dead walked straight into our ambush east of Fortress Hawthorne. That's what the fob is called now, Fortress Hawthorne. Despite it being officially known as Forward Operating Base Hawthorne, as was originally intended when the 50 detachments of various special operations groups came forward through time from Area 51. A one-way mission to save Western civilization from a rampaging nanoplague destroying the very fabric of said civilization. Apparently, we overshot the temporal insertion point and stuck the landing. Sorta. 
about 10,000 years too late. Said civilization is now basically something straight out of Tolkien, or Dungeons and Dragons, which we've all now gotten a lot more familiar with thanks to our resident expert and fledgling hedge wizard, the infamous P.F.C. Kennedy. But the Rangers just call it the FOB. The first of our explosives to ruin the leading elements of the Army of the Dead advancing on us, Claymore Mines, the recaptured forge back at Hawthorne had cranked out in the weeks after we'd retaken it from King Triton, were fired by Ranger Sergeant Kang down there with the scouts and Captain Knifehand's assaulters. It was close to midnight when the front rank of bony warriors, carrying rotting shields and spears, eyes glowing malevolently in the deep night mist, advanced into our ambush, only to get ruined by the daisy-chained Claymore's sudden eruption. Above us, a cloud-shrouded moon cast a wan yellow light over the battlefield. The night was hot, and spring was coming on full now. The pilots who'd gotten us here in the grounded C-17 back at Ranger Alamo, using their meteorology skills, had guessed it was going to be a long, hot summer ahead of us, and an early one at that. But there was a cold shiver in the dark on your exposed skin that you couldn't quite explain when you saw the dead advancing rank after rank. The bone warriors, carrying spear and shield, other, darker creatures barely seen. The lower areas of the earth were graveyard cool and misty, so maybe that was it. Still, the brutal, unrelenting cold of our almost last stand back at Ranger Alamo was gone now. But not the horrors. There wasn't a night that some ranger didn't wake up out of a tormented sleep, breathing heavy, sidearm scanning the dark and looking for orcs and ogres to ventilate. I was sweating in the hour leading up to the attack, despite the night and the mist. Kurtz had us humping hard to get the 240 and all its ammo up to the top of a small hill that overlooked the area where we'd channel the advancing echelons of the Army of the Dead into further fun and games the rangers had planned at a bend in a riverbed. If the approaching army of the dead continued on their current course track, they'd enter it for a brief period. It was decided by the captain we'd kill them there. And I was sweating. Not because of fear. No, not at all. Firing whispered Sergeant Kang over the calm as he detonated the mines. And eight daisy-chained claymores spat thousands of steel balls all across the front line of what even I was still finding it hard to believe I was seeing through my night vision device. Skeletons. Warrior skeletons. Ancient warriors like something out of the Bronze or Iron Ages. Worked breastplates of molded plate or rotting scales, green and tarnished, stamped with the markings of fabled armies fallen in battles long, long ago. Leather cuirasses on some, rotting boots, helms with broken horns, missing teeth, tattered leather kilts, beads and charms dangling from bone wrists, enigmatic holy signs and primal torques black with grave dirt, or from a funeral pyre long ago on some forgotten battlefield far from here, draped about the spine where the throat should be. Where it rises to connect to a bone-white skull that seems filled with malevolent purpose and diabolical intelligence. Malignantly so. Walking skeletons like something out of a Ray Harryhausen clay model Sinbad epic from the 1960s. Above, the sliver of moon gave enough light to strengthen our NVGs, making the night vision devices perform exceptionally well as we sprang our trap and watched the advancing elements get rocked by our initial high-explosive opening bid in the game we were about to play. The air was still and hot in the moments before the fight began as we lay there in the tall, sharp grass, waiting for it all to go down. I was thinking 
A hot cup of coffee would be nice about now. Except my canteen only had cold coffee I'd brewed during the long, silent, and windy afternoon of preparation. Still, I was happy knowing I had some, rather than none. Authors, if you're looking for a partner to help ensure that your book is the best it can possibly be, look no further than Pico's House. Crystal and her staff make a conscious effort to be critical, yet courteous. They also strive to make the business side of things run smoothly so that you can rest easy knowing that your manuscript is in capable hands. Whether you need beta reading, developmental editing, a manuscript critique, line editing, copy editing, or proofreading, Pico's House is the one-stop shop for you. Check them out today at picoshouse.com to get started.